Good morning. Welcome to Expanding Energy Frontiers on Earth, Moon, and Mars, one. Your session chairs are Lindsay Ross and me, Bill Ambrose. We hope you enjoy participating in this forum today. We encourage attendees like the presenters to express a diverse range of professional views on energy frontiers. Before we start, let me also point out the chat window on the right side of your screen. You can use this space to communicate with speakers and other attendees viewing the presentation. You can also engage with speakers, attendees, and exhibitors at any time using the ACE networking portal. We would like to encourage all attendees to join the post-session Q&A discussion by clicking the Zoom link provided in the left-hand resources column on the session page. Lindsay and I have recorded back-to-back -back introduction for the order of speakers, and I'll introduce our first speaker in Dong Min. Her presentation is titled, The Characteristics of a Helium-Rich Natural Gas Reservoir in the Guangzhou Basin in China. Dong Min's affiliation is with the Institute of Geomechanics, Chinese Academy of Geological Sciences, China Geological Survey, Ministry of Natural Resources in Beijing. With a doctoral degree in geology from the China University of Petroleum in Beijing, she specializes in the exploration and research in unconventional shale gas energy and helium. In her research on helium accumulation conditions in the Guangzhou Basin, she used fluid chronological data to constrain the helium accumulation sequence and built a helium accumulation model using numerical simulation. Please welcome Dong Min. The characteristic of helium-rich natural gas reservoir in the Guangzhou Base, China. My name is Domi. I came from China. I work at the Institute of Geomechanics in China Academy of the Geological Science. This is my presentation. Well, I am going to briefly answer the following question. Why is helium so scarce and important? How can we use the integration of the technical of the experimental method in helium reduce this wave? How is helium accumulated? Why is helium so scarce and important? The physical purpose of the helium. Helium is uh, all colorless, odorless, and the toxic rail gas with extremely inactive chemical properties. It's down the carburetor and not carbon. It is melting and boiling point at the lowest among the known elements. Since helium has unequal physical and chemical properties, it is widely used in high-tech fields, such as results, aviation and healthy care and exploitation are becoming increased wide. Helium has two-step isotope. Helium with relative atomic mass of three and helium with relative atomic mass of four. Three helium result from beta transformation of the tritium, and the nine comes from the mantle. Four helium is typically the product of the alpha decay of the radioactive elements, uranium uh, osirium, and as many came from the crust helium on Earth is mostly derived for from the crust and from helium rich natural gas. Helium in the lunar soil of a man, a moon is three helium. It's originating from the solar wind and is produced when its lunar soil absorbs solar radiation particle. Helium like coal, petrol, and other fuel in shortage. Once all helium results are used up, we will not find replaced. At present, the United States presents the 76% of world's total reverse of helium results. Faced with helium shortage, we must reduce amounts of extreme 
hidden results and improve liquid hidden equipment in order to prevent evaporation of reduced helium demands. Secondly, it is necessary to increase exploration, vital exploration of the new helium bearing natural gas field. Develop new helium pool type of extract helium from helium pool natural gas. The second one, geological basical background. The Guangzhou base is proving pressing in this regard, since it has both a band water helium and free state helium rich natural gas. This is easily utilized. The Guangzhou base is also called Weihe base and together with Fenghe base, called Fenwei Graben. The Guangzhou base is the geotechnic located to the north of Qinlin orogenic belt and to the south of Weihe northern mountain along the southern margin of the Edo's Bath. Extend east-west to Yuncheng and westwards to Baoji in Shanxi province. It is the central rock fault base which extends east and west with the natural west range wide the east steep south and gentle north. This is a program of structure and structure. Guangzhou base Helium isotoanalysis of natural gas samples from Guangzhou base shows so that three helmets ratio four helmets from two point two multiply to um, negative eight to six seventeen seven point eight multiply to negative 7 with an average of 1.02 multiply 10 negative 7 and R ratio Ra between 0 0.017 and 0 0.557 indicated crazy sourced helium with minimal mental source helium. Helium rich natural gas can be divided into helium bearing natural gas with the copper dioxide, which is very low helium contents and is very mixed natural gas of deep source in gas. And the mass combined natural gas with low copper dioxide and high metal content, which is a bell paralysis oranges. Based on research into the polling conditions of the physical and the chemical properties of helium, the main countries on helium yield have not been yet defined. According, it is urgent to conduct a deep study viewing well drilling and experimental date. The analysis of fruit in fruit. The fruit inclusion composition analysis and the temperature measurement and factor defend the stage of polling. For the Huashan, Baoqi, and Muhuguan granite interest in Guangzhou base, shows that inclusion composition of the cross fissures in granite has gas liquid to freeze inclusion and water sodium coverage, carbon dioxide. The liquid, liquid phaser is dominated by water and carbon dioxide, and the molar fraction of the water are more than 15%, whereas the gas phaser inclusion are dominated by carbon dioxide and meshing and the nitrogen with the min mineral hydrogen and uh, hydrogen sulfate. The gas phase inclusions can be classified further into earth stage. Second includes dominate by carbon dioxide and uh, natural nitrogen and later stage secondary inclusion with great machine. 
Using the THM set, the S six hundred type cooling and heating platform, the outside inclusion are found to have temperature will rise from one hundred and seventeen degrees to two hundred and thirteen degrees. The single wire battery history. Using the temperature of the inclusion with the um, Hydrocarbon inclusion, which the helium and taken to cross the single well bearing history based on geothermal involution. The result is that the late secondary inclusion formed in methane to placing the form formation time of later secondary inclusion in granite current vents on the source margin of the quantum base. Represent the helium fading time, which coincides with the base subsides. The increased strontium isotopic ratio in seawater at the beginning of the mining suggests that stronger uplift of the high flexion induced rock in the Himalayan crystallization zone caused the radioactive enrichment. Activation during the bearing period. Simple collected from the area express the complaint of a nailing, exciting new trap product in cooling vents. During the pattern fishing track testing, a simple yard fishing track is smaller than the string tip. Sedimentary age of samples suggests that simple and went te technical thermal events and annual after formation. The samples in Guangzhou base and give the the different area in Guangzhou base so the difference in uplifting and the characters. Fishing track record at eighteen four to. Sixty-nine million years. The base started to fault and accept sedimentary. The Qingling algaic belt express rapid uplift, and the base subsides and the mountain uplift were covered. Then forty-four to twenty-eight, the source major of Guangzhou base and Qingling algaic belt were uplift. Again, and that early stage secondary inclusion are dominated by carbon dioxide and uh, nitrogen. Well, whereas later stage secondary inclusion are rich in methane. Two stage of helium pooling are in the front. Appetite fishing track test the result in place that the technical thermal activity of the Guangzhou base has multiple stage and rock cooling events without the various process and the contrast of the fishing track age large stage talk later stage technical is shown to be key stage for helium test of Detroit. The car euro late age date reveal that the distribution of the the car euro late ages of the crustacean formation sand store in Guangzhou base is similar to properly denizen distribution of the the car euro late ages of the North China Canton and reflect the sedimentary respond the intercontinental origin. In this study, three measurement points on each Z-car sample obtained from the Guangzhou base was analyzed to date and assessed the structural significance of the detrital Z-cones. A result shows that age spectra of the Z-car can be divided into four groups: one hundred seventy-four to two hundred fifty-nine, two hundred and eighty-one. To five hundred and three, sixteen hundred and seventeen to one thousand one hundred and ninety-seven, and one thousand two hundred and eighteen to two thousand eight hundred and sixty-eight million years. 
based on the age of Zika features combined with the results of the prevent study, the sandstorm most likely original primo from the Qingling Organic Belt. The sedimentary age of sandstorm was Cretaceous period. The sandstorm and likely sedimentary response to the interplate light orange bite. The last one, how is helium accumulated? The helium accumulation mode, the helium contents of air is very long, and helium therein is predominant as a released from mid ocean ridge, volcano, and from magma degassing and rock weathering. By contrast, a very small amount of the atmospheric helium enters into the base flow system. Helium from the ground fluid system is a dominated, processed source and mental derived. A generation of helium from source rock is made ground and is accumulation in a trap from the dominant geology process. Involved with time, since helium has smaller radius and has great property for permeability than other guys, and the same preparation conditions, the lost volume helium is large. To mitigate these thoughts, the continuous supply of helium is needed. Helium originates from the atmospheric helium. Radioactive crust source helium and metal source helium from mantle to grass. In the base fluid system, ultrafreak helium entering to fluid through groundwater. In the groundwater supply iron base, helium solved in water and with the groundwater fluid system, migrate from the supply area to recharge the area. Helium that is soaked in water saturates from the free state helium before migrating to oil and natural gas reservoirs, where it becomes enriched. The helium in Guangzhou base is typically crust dew ribbed, even though most of the amount of the mantle sourced gas have been obtained from the helium near deep and large folds along the southern major of the base. The uran rich granite in Guangzhou base is the mine sound struck across the derived helium fault zone. The helium generated from alpha decay of the radioactive elements in crust of Earth, especially uranium and ceram, are often confined by the same feature and trapped natural gas, resulting in human-rich natural gas home. We examination the inclusion composition of the carbon fission of the uranium rich grant mass samples yield a lesser rama spectroscope and measure the temperature of the inclusion based on the field sulfur technical survey. Within this base, helium has been detected in deep of time as a component dissolved in German geothermal water and like composition helium rich natural gas. This new type is the in water. Therefore, it is crucial to consider the helium pooling character and enriched the patterns in Guangzhou base for understanding the surface technical, deep texture, and geochemical packages. Crystal salt helium is product of alpha decay of the mineral that rich in radioactive uranium and ceram. Compare analysis results of contents and the radioactive intensity of the radioactive elements in the Guangzhou base shows that granite of the Lantian entrance and Mohuguan entrance have high radioactive elements contents and radioactive intensity and other main 
south rocks of Grosses, hillum of the region. The upper pillar co-metro co south rocks of the Guangzhou base prevent the metro basins for the hillum carry gas river works. Thank you for your attention. Your kind comments are precious. Acknowledgement. This study was fantasy, fantasy supposed by the Institute of Geomechanics in China Academy of the Geological Science and the Geology Survey Project and the King Laboratory of the Pilomagnetism and Tectonic reconstruction of the Ministry of Natural Source Resource and the King Laboratory of the Study of the Focused Magmatism and the Giant on Deposits. That's all. Thank you. I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker in David Seneshin with Surface Geochemical Exploration Surveys for Helium and Uranium Deposits. David's affiliation is with Geochemical Insight in Denver, Colorado. In this presentation, David highlights how surface geochemical tools can be used to explore for both uranium and helium using alpha decay products, and how surface geochemical tools for collecting and analyzing these alpha decay products help to find uranium and helium deposits through exploration case studies in the USA and Canada. David received his doctorate in exploration geochemistry from Queen's University in Kingston, Canada. David is currently optimizing surface geochemical exploration methods for oil and gas in the Arctic and tropical Indonesia terrains and for helium in the USA. Welcome, David. Today, I'd like to talk to you about surface geochemical methods to help reduce exploration risk for helium and uranium deposits. There is currently strong demand for helium and we need innovative geochemical exploration methods to discover new reserves. As our reliance on fossil fuels decreases over time, We'll also need reliable, high-density nuclear energy sources to supply our growing electricity demand. Soil gas and helium radon methods will therefore be needed to find blind uranium deposits as most outcropping ore bodies have been found. Here's the outline of the presentation. We start out by exploring the origin of helium and radon, which are indicator and pathfinder elements to helium deposits and uranium deposits respectively. The sample collection media and anal analytical methods used for helium and uranium exploration will then be presented. It is important to remember that sampling and analytical methods are tailored to the specific project. The results of geochemical surveys over helium and uranium deposits in the US and Canada will then be provided to demonstrate the effectiveness of these methods when used correctly. By correctly, I mean that the samples are taken consistently and at close enough intervals to see multi-sample anomalies over the target. I'll then bring together everything that I've presented into a concise summary at the end and make some recommendations for future research to improve these geochemical methods. In regards to the formation of helium, an unstable radionuclide emits an alpha particle consisting of two protons and two neutrons or a positively charged helium nucleus which becomes a helium atom after it captures two electrons. So for instance, the uranium-238 isotope will give off two protons and two neutrons during decay to thorium-234 plus helium-4. Another reaction within the uranium-238 decay series involves alpha decay of the radium-226 isotope to radon-222 gas. Radon-222 has a half-life of 3.8 days meaning that only half the gas remains, uh, remains 3.8 days after it formed. Within the thorium-228 decay series, radium-224 undergoes alpha decay to radium radon-220 or thoron, which has a half-life of only 55 seconds. The fact that helium-4 and radon-222 are formed by radioactive decay of uranium means that these mobile gases can be used as pathfinders to bury uranium mineralization. In a similar fashion, helium gas seeps can be used to find helium deposits. The question now is, what are the best ways to collect and analyze these gases? And what kind of expression do they have over buried helium and uranium deposits? 
Active pore gas samples can be collected by pulling gas from a geoprobe post-run tubing system with a syringe and filling pre-evacuated Tedlar bags or glass vials. The geoprobe sampling method allows for consistent gas collection from depths ranging from 3 to 20 feet. I'm still experimenting with various sample depths over known helium reservoirs to find which depth provides the best contrast between anomalous and background helium concentrations. Passive gas collection methods involve leaving a track etch cup buried six inches in the soil for one week. The radon alpha particles from form fission tracks on cellulose nitrate or polycarbonate films that are then counted under a low power microscope and converted to radon concentration in picocuries per liter. This method worked well in a radon survey we did in Dolores Canyon, Colorado, looking for roll front uranium deposits in the salt wash member of the Morris Information. Lake bottom sediments are collected from a boat or helicopter pontoon using various gravity and direct push coring devices. The samples are analyzed for radon on site because of its relatively short half-life. The lake sediments are also analyzed for indicator and pathfinder elements to help in the search for buried uranium deposits. An indicator element refers to the commodity being explored for. So uranium would be an indicator element for uranium deposits, whereas a pathfinder to the uranium mineralization could be radon. Surface springs and ponds and groundwater from domestic and stock wells can be sampled for dissolved helium and radon analysis. The photograph in the far lower right shows how surface spring water is collected using the copper tube method to measure dissolved helium concentrations. The portable Agilent helium detector utilizes an ion pump technology to measure helium concentrations as low as two parts per million above ambient levels of 5.2 parts per million. It can be used to sniff the headspace of oil and gas and water wells and springs for helium, but it is not sensitive enough for reliable soil gas helium analysis in the field. A more sensitive portable instrument is the Mini Rudy Quadrupole Mass Spectrometer developed by the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology. It measures the concentrations of neon, argon, krypton, methane, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and nitrogen in soil gas with an analytical uncertainty of 1 to 3%. I am currently evaluating this instrument for on site analysis of soil gas samples in the US. The mini Rudy must be used in a temperature controlled environment like an air conditioned trailer for optimal results. The portable pylon alpha scintillometer can be used in the field to measure radon 222 and thoron, which is radon 220, concentrations, which have a relatively short half life. The soil gas is injected into the scintillation cell, and radon alpha particles bombard a zinc salt silver sulfide coating on the inside of the cell giving off photons of light. The photon detector in the monitor converts the photons to an electric pulse, and based on the number of counts over a period of time, the radon and thoron concentrations in the gas sample can be determined. Each cell is counted for 10 minutes to remove the effect of thoron on the results, which has a short half-life of only 55 seconds. The photograph shows us measuring radon concentrations in 15-foot deep soil gas samples taken with a geoprobe drill over a roll front uranium property near Cheyenne, Wyoming. The photo on the right shows how we measure radon concentrations in lake bottom sediments by forcing air up through the sediment with an aquarium bubbler and then channeling that air into a scintillation cell for counting photons over time that are converted to radon concentrations in picocuries per liter. The Radelec EPERM radon flux monitor consists of a positively charged Teflon disc or electra with a 750 volt potential, which is housed in an electrically conducted plastic holder or radon flux monitor. When radon and its daughter products decay in the flux monitor, the alpha particles create negatively charged ions in the air that drop the voltage across the positively charged electra. The radon concentration is directly related to this voltage drop over a given area and known time. The radon flux measurements are given in becquerels per square meter per hour. This method, which involves leaving the flux monitors on the ground for six hours and then reading voltage drops on electrodes to get radon concentrations, is superior to track etch type collectors as radon results can be obtained in the field rather than having to send the track etch cups out to a laboratory for two weeks 
for counting fission trucks and, for, and converting those to radon concentrations. We will now look at the results of soil gas helium surveys over the Harley Dome field in eastern Utah and an oil helium field in southeast Colorado. These lo the locations are shown on the map of U.S. helium fields from Jordan's search and discovery article published in 2016. The Harley Dome gas field in Grand County, Utah is hosted in a Jurassic Entrada sandstone reservoir at 965 foot depth. The reservoir contains 7% helium with the balance being mainly nitrogen with minor methane and carbon dioxide. The helium is concentrated at the top of a structural dome that has been truncated by a normal fault that drops the east block down about 400 feet. Three three foot deep soil gas samples were collected at 150 meter intervals on a one and a half square mile grid over the faulted dome and also along a road to the east and northeast of the dome. The soil gas samples were analyzed for helium by geofrontiers on their mass spectrometer. As you can see from the bubble plot, most of the outlier and extreme helium concentrations are found near the productive wells at the top of the dome, whereas other, other anomalies to the west and southwest along canyons may be related to helium leaking up northeast trending faults. Outlier and extreme helium concentrations start at 1.5 and 3 times the interquartile range, respectively. There can be no other explanation for the high contrast helium anomalies other than helium is leaking from the reservoir itself. The Precambrian basement source rock for the helium is located only 1,000 feet below the Entrada Reservoir. A small helium and oil field in southeast Colorado is hosted by a V5 Pennsylvania Moro sandstone. The reservoir contains 3.26% helium, with the balance being two-thirds nitrogen and one-third hydrocarbons, based on the analysis of gas from the shut-in well shown. We collected soil gas from 12 foot depth using a geoprobe direct push drill at 200 meter intervals over about one and a half square miles. Extreme and outlier helium concentrations are observed in soil gas near the shut-in oil well and also to the west and southeast of the well. Locations shown in blue well symbols were permitted for drilling the anomalous areas west and southeast of the oil well, but these were abandoned for unknown reasons. 12 foot deep soil gas samples were collected at 10 to 50 meter intervals along a 600 meter long line over the 200 meter deep Lance Roll Front uranium mineralization in Goshen County, Wyoming. Hydrogen and ethane anomalies are evident directly over the surface projection of the mineralization, but the radon and helium anomalies are found down gradient of the mineralization. The seeping hydrogen and ethane could be the reductant that caused precipitation of uranium from eastward moving oxidized solutions. The mineralization may also have been displaced eastwards by groundwater, resulting in radon and helium anomalies down gradient of the first occurrence of mineralization. Reimer and others used a portable mass spectrometer developed at the USGS back in the 70s to measure low level helium concentrations over and down gradient of roll front uranium mineralization in Well County, Colorado. The highest soil gas helium concentrations are 100 to 1,000 meters down gradient of the buried mineralization, suggesting lateral displacement of the mineralization by groundwater. Note that the contour interval for helium is 10 parts per billion, which represents an incredible sensitivity for their mass spectrometer built in the 70s. Their best helium anomaly is only 50 parts per billion above an ambient concentration of 5,240 parts per billion. Radon and trace elements were determined in lake bottom sediments over and adjacent to the subaqueous subcropping O2 next uranium deposit at the southern end of Wollaston Lake in the Athabasca Basin in northern Saskatchewan, Canada. Radon and uranium concentrations are anomalous in lake bottom sediments at the southern terminus of the ore body and also to the west of the ore body shown in pink. One outlier sample shown as a green star had very high radon and trace metal concentrations possibly because the actual subcropping ore body was sampled with the lake sediment coring device. Samples collected over an unmineralized area north of the O2 next deposit had background radon and uranium concentrations. This technology based on the O2 next orientation survey was used to explore other parts of Walston Lake for subaqueous uranium deposits. 
Radon flux was measured over outcropping caliche hosted uranium mineralization and thick overburden areas in southern Argentina using the Radilac radon flux monitor presented earlier. Overburden in the survey area ranges from 0 to 200 meters in thickness. The radon flux monitors were placed on the ground for six hours at 50 to 100 meter intervals. Most of the radon anomalies are clustered in areas of outcropping mineralization outlined in blue, but there are also also anomalies over thicker overburden that may reflect buried uranium mineralization. Anomalous uranium concentrations in soil samples are mainly confined to the outcropping and subcropping mineralization itself, without many anomalies over thicker overburden areas. This shows that radon gas can ascend to surface easier than uranium itself. And now to sum up what I've presented so far. Helium and radon are produced through alpha decay of uranium-238 and radium, respectively. Helium and radon are mobile gases, and they are therefore good, indicators, good indicator and pathfinder elements for finding deeply buried uranium deposits, as gas can move through overburden faster than dissolved metals can. Helium is also a very good indicator element for helium deposits. Sample media and analytical methods are tailored to the project area. For example, radon concentrations were measured in lake bottom sediments in Saskatchewan as we were ex exploring for uranium deposits underwater there. In the remote San Jorge Basin of southern Argentina, we used the radon flux monitors to get real-time radon analyses in this remote area. In arid Utah and Colorado, both shallow and deep soil gas samples were effective for identifying 965 and 5,000 foot deep helium deposits. We see both helium and radon anomalies over uranium deposits as seen in the Lance Orientation Survey in Southeast Wyoming. And we see helium anomalies over helium deposits as seen over the Harley Dome field. It would be interesting to know if there are also soil gas radon anomalies over helium deposits, as both elements are derived through alpha decay within the uranium-238 decay series. Future research should include testing for radon anomalies over helium deposits, evaluating anomaly contrast with sample depth, and surveys should also be repeated in different seasons to test their re reproducibility. Thank you for listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. I am pleased to introduce our third speaker, Stephen Sivray, with Recognizing Uranium Source Rocks in the Sedimentary Environment. Steve's affiliation is with the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Steve is a certified petroleum geologist. He has worked as a hydrogeologist for the University of Nebraska for the last 30 years. Steve has also worked for Exxon Corporation and Pathfinder Mines Corporation. He also serves as the research vice chairman of the Uranium Committee of the Energy Minerals Division of AEPG. Welcome, Steve. My talk today is on recognizing uranium source rocks in the sedimentary environment. If we look at price of uranium through time, we see that in the mid-1970s, we had a uranium boom. The price was very high because we were anticipating that all our electrical power generation would be coming from nuclear power. Due to Three Mile Island accident and other problems, that never happened and uranium price fell for about 30 years. Then in the mid 2000s, two mines flooded in Canada and we had a price spike. That was temporary. Then 2011, Fukushima happened and then Japan took all their nuclear power plants offline. That was a tremendous blow to the uranium mining industry. However, more recently, Uranium spot prices increased starting in March 2020. If we look at uranium exploration strategies in the late 1940s and 50s, we had direct detection of radiation near the surface. In the late 1960s, early 70s, industry geologists exploring for uranium in Wyoming developed what we call the roll front model. It has been extremely successful in finding uranium deposits in sedimentary rocks. Uranium source for these deposits is thought to be granites and tabaceous sediments. 
Carbonaceous marine shales are also high in uranium, but to date, no deposits have been linked to marine shales. All Cenozoic sandstone deposits are roll fronts. Significant sedimentary deposits are not roll fronts. And some roll front deposits have been modified, so it's difficult to locate these deposits by using the roll front model. This is a generalized roll front uranium deposit uh, model. It's very simplified. What you have is uranium rich groundwater that's high in oxygen, intrudes into an aquifer that has low oxygen concentrations, and it typically has maybe pyrite and carbonaceous material and uranium minerals that are tetravalent, such as coffinite and uraninite, precipitate out at that interface. These minerals are not readily identified in the cuttings. However, iron minerals are. And what typically we see are sandstones that are stained yellow or red with oxidized iron minerals on the up gradient side. On the down gradient side, we can see pyrite. This, looking at the sediments and the cuttings, you look at the iron minerals in order to, to explore for to the conventional roll front deposits. This is a photograph of a roll front deposit in Live Oak County, Texas. And what we see in the center is an oxidized zone. And there may be a little bit of iron minerals here that are oxygen, uh, that, are, uh, that are hematite or limonite. Then we have uranium minerals associated with this darker zone. They may be darker, darker due to carbonaceous material and or a little bit of pyrite. Below that we have a molybdenum zone and a selenium zone. This slide shows the details of a geophysical, of a roll front deposit, the geophysical and mineralogical relationships. And uh, I would, we're not going to talk about the very different uh, characteristics of these deposits, but I would suggest that if you are look at the references cited at the end of this um, PowerPoint, uh, you can get a good idea of the details of the development. One thing I will point out is that the gamma uh, uh, has a characteristic signature as you go across the roll front. Earlier we showed you a very simplistic diagram showing a uh, roll front deposit. This goes through the details. Think of it as a complex biogeochemical cell that takes place and the exact chemistry depends on the sediment uh, chemistry and the water chemistry and it can be very variable but it is a biogeochemical cell. In the Carl Plateau area we have what we call tabular sandstone uranium deposits. These are carbonaceous rich zones with, um, with typically tetravalent coffinite, maybe some uraninite. They're completely surrounded by reduced situation where you have pyrite in place. And typically you uh, these have been found by looking at surface expression, but there are probably many more of these out there that uh, need to be explored in the future. The origin of these is somewhat speculative. We also can have a re-reduced roll front to take place. We can have introduction of hydrogen sulfide gas and methane that are introduced by faults, and this can change the iron minerals, but the uranium minerals will stay locked in place. And you also have generation of biogenic methane gas will do the same thing. In other situations, a roll front can be modified, at least with iron minerals. It may be leached out or bleached. You may get a bleached looking sandstone when the iron minerals are removed by reducing conditions and uh, maybe slightly acidic groundwater. But the uranium main remains in place. There are also significant deposits that are not in, in uh, sandstones. There's carbonates. An example would be the Tadilto limestone in Grants, New Mexico. It is part of what I would call the Jurassic Morrison uranium system. 
There are breccia pipes in northern Arizona that are small but high grade. The dates of the uranium lead uh, in that system is, is Triassic in age, and it may be part of the Triassic Chin Li uranium system. There are mixed types, very high grade unconformity deposits in, in uh, Canada and Australia. Um, and then there's also hydrothermal deposits in China, where some researchers believe that the uranium source is from the shallow meteoric water. What, I think we can do a better job of understanding the source of uranium and we can explore for these types that are not the typical roll front deposits. If we're going to explore for these deposits, we have to understand uranium systems. Analogy would be the petroleum systems approach, where you have a source rock, you have a migration path, and a trap. We need to identify uranium source rocks for frontier exploration in other areas, and we need to incorporate paleohydrogeology. Our caustic sediments, as I mentioned earlier, uh, are a source. Some granites are more leachable than others. If uranium is present in alanite or uranothorite, they may be more readily leached than the granites that have zircon and monzonite as the main accessory uranium minerals. Research in the granite mountains in Wyoming has shown, as uh, USGS has shown that uranium lead systematics and uranium thorium ratios indicate that there was a loss of uranium in these grants back in the tertiary. There are potential granite sources in, of course, I mentioned Wyoming, but also collateral Colorado Plateau, but not Texas. In Australia, there are Paleo Valley roll front deposits and calcrete, which is a totally different type of deposit, that are uh, sourced from granites. Tuffaceous sediments, we're looking at volcanic glass, and typically if you weather it, the glass becomes hydrated and you turn it into clay, you release silica, and you release hexavalent uranium in solution if the environment is oxygen rich. Volcanic plastics as a uranium source, they are thought to be important in Wyoming, Colorado Plateau, and Texas. Rhyolitic glass is high in uranium and easily leached. Research by the Bureau of Texas, uh, University of uh, Texas, Bureau of Economic Geology, uh, 1981, indicated that petrogenesis or soil formation above the, the, in the Vado zone above the water table is important in generating uranium solutions. Bob Zielinski with the USGS published in 1983, looked at uh, White River Group sediments and decided that high thorium uranium ratios indicate leaching of uranium out of these. And it's thought that the White River Group is a source of, uh, in Wyoming, in Nebraska, and Colorado. Source rocks are thought to be paleosols with high thorium uranium. And these are paleosols developed in volcanic plastics. White River Group, Badlands National Park, you have the Brule Formation, the Shavern Formation, this kind of grayish, uh, whitish area here, and the Chamberlain Pass Formation is represented by the interior Paleosol, which is a reddish Paleosol located here. The rest of the Chamberlain Pass is not seen in this area. Yellow Mountains Paleosol is a very thick Paleosol that developed on top of the Cretaceous sometime in the tertiary. Yellow Mounds Paleosol in Sioux County, Nebraska. You can see all the uh, yellowish material that are iron oxides that uh, are from the weathering of pyrite within the Black Pierre Shale. And uh, it's thought that uh, uranium is leached out of that. We'll go into that a little bit later. We can talk about in Nebraska, we have what we think are a couple potential source rocks for the uranium deposits. 
First and foremost is the anterior pedicel, which developed on top of the Chamberlain Pass formation. If there's rhyolitic material in there, that would be an excellent source. The anterior pedicel is a geosol. It developed in relation to an unconformity. Another geosol is the yellow mouse pedicel we saw earlier. They're also oxidizing, looking paleosols in the lower portion of the Shadron Formation. In the upper part of the Shadron Formation, we have lacustrian limestones. The clays and paleosols are mostly greenish or gray in color, and it's thought to have limited vadosome and probably limited migration of uranium after leaching. This is the basal Shadron Formation in South Dakota. It has a lot of graminic material in it. We have the basal Chamberlain Pass in contrast, and the Sioux County is very different. The lithology is largely, and in, in these little pebbles and gravels are typically chert and quartzite and quartz. Very different in composition, very different, uh, if you will, environment. This is a combination mud log and uh, electric log through a test hole that we drilled for some clients in Nebraska. And ignore the colors over here, that's from Rockworks. Note the descriptions here. We have a clay stone in this area that's greenish. It also has fairly high gamma. Down here we have a yellow uh, paleosol weather, and it's lower in gamma. We have a mottled paleosol down here. We have both yellow and some unweathered material. And here we have a, a, uranium, a gamma spike here right before we go into the uh, fairly high gamma in the uh, Pierre Shale. This demonstrates the fact that we have a paleosol developed on top of the Pierre Shale that releases uranium into the system. And, but now most of the uranium either went down vertically or it ended up in the Gulf of Mexico. There was no, if you will, receiving aquifer to uh, develop a uranium deposit. But this shows you that paleosols are important in redistributing uranium in sediments. This is the Shadron clay, weathered paleosol, highly weathered, yellowish, um, weathered yellow mounds paleosol. We have a mottled paleosol over on the on the right, one over right here. And then we have unweathered Pierre Shale here, where uranium is probably present in finely disseminated uraninite at relatively low concentration. We can talk about the Crow Butte deposit in Dawes County, Nebraska. Discovery announced in 1981, over 25 million pounds, greater than 0.25 percent. Production started in 1991, and they are currently shut in. It's an in-situ leach mine, or I can say in-situ recovery mine is the correct terminology. It produced approximately 800,000 pounds of U308 a year. Total production is 18 million pounds. It's thought to be in the Basal White River Group, or it isn't in the Basal White River Group, which is thought to be Chamberlain Pass, but possibly could be uh, lower Shadron. This map shows the distribution of basal sands in the White River Group in the Nebraska Panhandle. And uh, there's very thick sequence here that comes in from Wyoming. Uranium mineralization is present in this area all the way down into Cheyenne County. We have the uranium discovery was in here. It's been mined out mostly in this area here. There's other future development in this area for price recoveries. Um, what we have here uh, is a area that is six miles long and about a quarter mile wide that's been developed in typical roll fund. What is interesting to us is when you look at the Chamberlain Pass outcrops here, it looks like it's a major tributary that runs into this area, but it's totally devoid of uranium mineralization. So, what is, there's kind of a mystery here. What happened? Why is uranium coming in from here, but not necessarily here? And that is an interesting question. The upper Shattern formation in this area contains greenish clay, 
they ha has a, it has limited vedo zone. Your uranium may have been released, but limited vertical migration. It may be there, but it hasn't migrated. Is there a lack of granitic source? I showed you the slide earlier where it's mostly chert and quartz and quartzite. Also, there may be a lack of rhyolitic source in the interior paleosol. And, of course, there could be a lack of reductive and fluvial segments. However, an interesting thing has come up recently with research done by the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, uranium may have migrated through, but there may have been no accumulation at the outcrops that we see. Now, uh, Julie Leipold in, published a dissertation where she looked at quartz in the sandstones using catholuminescence microscopy. They found radiation damage in the ore zone, but not upgradient. The lack of radiation damage and upgrading course suggests it never hosted ore. So this leads us to believe that maybe roll fronts move periodically or only f form under certain favorable biological geochemical conditions. And uh, it, uh, we always used to think of roll fronts as migrating continuously, but that may not be the case. If we look at outcrops in the Sioux County area, this is an area where the basal sands are not present. What we have, this is probably a high area. We have the interior paleosol, this reddish material here, overlaying the yellow mounds paleosol, which remember is depleted in uranium. And we have the, yeah, the, the greenish clays here, the upper shattering. The lower shattering is, is not present. But if this had rhyolitic material in the parent material, then you might expect uranium to have migrated through this area. Maybe the interior Paleosol and the Chamberlain Pass formation is older than the White River group, and maybe there's no volcanic plastics in it. We really don't know the answer to this. This is further to the east, not too far from here, a couple miles to the east. We have the Weta Paleosol, which is the equivalent to the interior Paleosol. It's a hydromorphic. It shows both oxidizing and reducing conditions. And we have that. This is that white Chamberlain Pass sandstone. And on top of that, we have the a clay plug that uh, formed in a beyond, in a abandoned meander loop in the uh, in the Chamberlain Pass area, uh, deposition. And this material is thought to be derived from the Black Hills, and possibly from the Spearfish Formation. This is the base of that uh, crop in a, in a certain area that has, this looks like carbonation material, but it's not. What it is, manganese oxides. Manganese uh, is mobile under reducing conditions, and it uh, precipitates out on, on oxidizing conditions, exact opposite of uranium. Down here, we have weathered Pierre Shale, a little bit of Yellow Mounds Paleosol, and uh, in this area. What we see on those two slides, over to the west, we had Bentonitic Mudstone. We had the interior Paleosol develop on top of the Yellow Mounds Paleosol. You would think if this is rhyolitic in nature, in, in part of the White River Group, that you would release uranium and it may have precipitated out during the reducing conditions in this sandstone. Or maybe perhaps uranium is not, and maybe there isn't any rhyolitic material in here. And uh, it just developed on top of yellow mounds where it was depleted in uranium. But if it had rhyolitic, maybe it just passed through this system to an area where it uh, was more favorable for the precipitation of uranium. Very interesting situation. It would be great to do some field work plus geochemistry and petrographic work. If we look at the geochemical petrographic area of the White River Group, I think we can understand uranium systems better. We expect that thorium uranium ratios are relatively constant in a volcanic source. They both are large ions and concentrate in the more felsic uh, end members. In the White River Group, in the Brule Formation, we have andesite to rhyolite composition of 
of uh, volcanic ashes that are relatively unaltered. Great place to get an idea of the thorium uranium ratios, as noted by Bob Zelensky. Thorium is not mobile during weather, but uranium is. And we expect to see higher thorium uranium ratios in the highly weathered Paleosol. Rare earth elements have been used recently to characterize paramaterial in Paleosol. It'd be very interesting to see if the interior Paleosol is developed strictly from the Yellow Mountains Paleosol, or is there rhyolitic material in there as a possible parent material? What's also really exciting is that Paleosols have been extensively studied in the Morrison Formation and Chin Lee group deposits by paleontologists and others that are interested in climate change. They're also interested in the evolution of dinosaurs. But these paleosols have not been studied in regards to their possible sources of uranium in these important deposits in the Colorado Plateau. In conclusion, what we see is in the Yellow Mounds paleosol, we, our test hole drilling has shown that it's perhaps depleted in uranium. The uranium migrated downward or to the Gulf. The possible source rocks in the deposits in, in Wyoming and Nebraska and Colorado may be eocene oxidizing paleosols. The interior paleosol is a possibility. Also, the lower shattering paleosols are all another possibility. I think geochemistry and paleopedology can help define source rocks in our exploration for unconventional sedimentary uranium deposits. Thank you very much. Acknowledgements. Nebraska Public Power, Nebraska Department of Environmental and Energy have been clients for us, and they've done a, uh, some, they have funded our test hole drilling program. The EBICA has been great on getting me uh, cartography done and uh, doing my graphics. I also like to recognize the editors of the I2M web portal. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to introduce our final speaker for this session in Sheila Gerardo with coal fly ash characterization for rare earth elements recovery. Sheila's affiliation is with the University of Texas at Austin. Sheila's presentation focuses on the characterization and recovery of rare earth elements from coal fly ash and a novel method for significantly increased recovery of these elements. Sheila has a bachelor's degree in petroleum engineering from the University of Oklahoma and a Master of Science from the University of Texas at Austin. Welcome, Sheila. Hi, my name is Sheila Gerardo, and I am a second year master's student under Dr. Wayne Song's research group at the University of Texas at Austin. And I'm really excited to be here at ACE this year to share a little bit about my research, which focuses on coal fly ash characterization for rare earth elements recovery. There are three key takeaways from my presentation today. First, I'll be talking about rare earth elements resources and how they are critical for several high-end industries, as well as the need for the United States to develop domestic supplies to meet the growing demands for these materials. Second, I'll be talking about how coal fly ash could be repurposed to explore rare earth elements out of it, as well as help meet the growing demands, as I just mentioned. And third, I'll be describing how we could use microfluidics and develop microfluidic devices that would allow us to develop a very fundamental understanding of how to explore rare earth elements out of coal fly ash in a way that we could ultimately upscale and make it an efficient and economically feasible project. But first and foremost, what are rare earth elements? So rare earth elements are a group of elements comprised of the lanthanides group plus scandium and yttrium. So even though rare earth elements are called rare, they're actually quite abundant in the rare earth's crust. The key issue is that it's really hard to find those elements in concentrations that are large enough to allow economically, uh, an economically feasible exploration of these materials. The thing about rare earth elements is that they are fundamental materials at several industries. For instance, if you look at the pie chart on your left, 
you can clearly see that they're used 55 percent of them are used in the catalyst industry they're used in ceramics and metallurgy and glass polishing and if that doesn't ring a bell we can put it in even smaller, more everyday uh, terms. For instance, without neodymium, you probably wouldn't have the efficient computers that you're using to access this presentation right now. And without europium, you wouldn't be able to have a red color on your screens or your TVs. So that just puts in perspective on how much of an impact and an outreach or the number of industries that rare earth elements are used for. So with all that need for rare earth elements, it's obviously expected that their demand is predicted to be exponentially rising, as you can see on the graph at the right. So it is important to develop resources that can actually meet those increasing demands for rare earth elements. So with that in mind, we can look at the production of rare earth elements in the United States and in the world just to give you an idea. But when we look at that, what we see is that the majority of the rare earth elements worldwide are being produced in China. We're talking about over 80% of the entire world's production of rare earth elements. And this is a key problem because in the recent years, China has been imposing restrictions on the rare earth elements exports. That, so the United States has a key need to start developing domestic supplies to meet those growing demands that we just saw. Now, there is, um, there are mines undergoing or already, you know, in work, such as the Mountain Pass mine in California, but the United States in 2019 still imported over $170 million worth of rare earth elements. So there is definitely still a need to look at secondary resources that we could tap into to meet those demands. A potential rare earth elements resource that has been in study to meet some of those growing demands is coal fly ash. So coal fly ash is a powder-like substance that is comprised of this very tiny couple of microns all the way to a couple of hundreds of microns uh, glass spherules and they are generated as a coal combustion byproduct so as you burn your coal you get this very tiny particulates that are pulverized and fly up the combustion chamber now the key thing why we're looking at coal fly ash specifically is that coal itself already shows some rare earth elements potential but when you uh, when you burn your coal what you actually have is that is an enriched material that is left because you're burning all the organic compounds so what you're truly left is with those heavy metals which includes the rare earth elements Besides the high rare earth elements concentrations, reutilizing coal fly ash for rare earth elements also presents other key benefits. One, coal fly ash is quite abundant and underused. The United States in recent years has produced about 40 million tons of fly ash, but only half of that has been reutilized. So we have this massive stockpile of material that we could be repurposing for RE's recovery. Second, Coal fly ash procurement and exploration doesn't have the same environmental impact as heavy mining. For instance, when you look at rare earth elements exploration from traditional ore deposits, one of the largest ore deposit mines has a waste pond that is the size of three New York City Central Park. So this is a significant environmental footprint that we could avoid by tapping into coal fly ash instead. Thus, our research focuses on developing a microscopic understanding of rare earth elements potential for recovery from coal fly ash. And we do that through elemental characterization so we can truly understand what is the potential for earth elements in terms of concentrations, but also where within those glassy spheres or particulates the rare earth elements are distributed. And second, we develop a microfluidic device that allow the direct visualization of the reaction kinetics so we can develop an efficient way of tapping and exploring the rare earth elements out of the coal fly ash. So for this research, we're focusing on three different coal fly ash samples from three different basins. So we're looking at a fly ash sample from the Illinois basin, which comes from a subbituminous coal. 
we're looking for or at a sample from the Green River Basin, which is lignite coal, and we're looking at a sample from Powder River Basin, which is subbituminous coal. Our characterization was made into two steps. First, we used the raw fly ash material and we completely dissolved it so we can actually analyze it using inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. And what that tells us is the total rare earth elements concentration within our samples, which is fundamental so we can actually backtrack and see if this would be a significant concentration and a path worth pursuing per se. We also looked at the scanning electron microscopy uh, equipped with energy dispersive uh, X-ray spectroscopy. And what we use that for is to develop a spatial understanding of the elemental composition of our fly ash on its surface. Because we really need to understand where within the coal fly ash samples, where earth elements are located. This is how we can leverage that information to actually develop an efficient form of exploring them out. Now, given that our fly ash samples are tiny micron scale uh, spheres, are full spheres, we needed to actually expose their insights so we can also conduct a full spatial characterization of our elemental composition. So what we did is that we fused our raw fly ash material into a solid material and then we iron milled so we could actually expose the interior of our fly ash and after exposing that interior we used SEM EDS to actually develop spatial elemental uh, mapping of different components present within our cold fly ash samples. So our ICPMS results indicate that all three uh, coal fly ash samples show significant concentrations of rare earth elements. So the Illinois Basin sample presented about 700 parts per million of rare earth elements in total. The Green River Basin showed about a little over 500 parts per million of total rare earth elements. And the Powder River Basin showed about 420 parts per million in total of rare earth elements. Now, two key things here is that one, when you look at which elements are quite abundant, you can clearly see that it's mostly the live rare earth elements, such as lanthanum and cerium, which across all three samples do rack up on the hundreds, a little over a hundred parts per million. But you can also see that you have significant concentrations of a couple of other critical rare earth elements, such as yttrium that gets close to almost a hundred in the Illinois basin and neodymium, which is even over a hundred parts per million in the Illinois basin. So that is very promising uh, concentrations for rare earth elements, especially for those critical rare earth elements. In terms of spatial characterization, what we observed is that our coal fly ash samples across all three basins are mostly comprised of this aluminous silicate glasses, uh, glassy spheres. So what you actually see in the EDS spectra is that mostly aluminum, silica, oxygen, and a couple of other metal oxides are the things that truly pop up. So that tells you that the main matrix of our material that we're working with, it's those alumina silicate spherules, and there's very little to no signal of rare earth elements at the surface. Now, when you actually look at the internal structure of those spherules, for instance, when you look at this fused uh, slash iron milled sample, what we look at and start seeing is some really interesting uh, structures start popping up. So you start seeing some iron compounds within those fly ash spherules, but also you start seeing some uh, minerals that are often associated with rare earth elements, such as this tiny zircon mineral that has been identified. Now, when you look at this different location uh, within our fused fly ash samples, what we see is that, for instance, at this spot where we observed where you have a really high Z contrast observed through the SEM microscope, if you actually do the EDS map on it, you can clearly see that for silicon and for aluminum, this high Z contrast areas show very little 
to know a uh, silicon aluminum signal. Now, what's interesting is that if you actually look at the zircon and the phosphorus signal, you can clearly see that it's relatively stronger within those high Z contrast zones. So then we look at the rare earth element signals, and you can see that, for instance, neodymium, cerium, even lanthanum and yttrium actually showed a also stronger signal within those high Z contrast zones. So what that tells us is that our rare earth elements, which as we expected based on previous literature on this, they're actually associated with phosphates and other critical minerals that bear rare earth elements. And they often tend to accumulate and get encapsulated within those glassy spheres. And that is very fundamental and very important given that that tells us that leaching the surface of our fly ash will just not be enough to actually recover the rare earth elements. So it is really fundamental that we look at this solution to explore rare earth elements out of this material. Now, to be able to study how we can recover the rare earth elements that are embedded within our glass spheres, we developed a microfluidic device that is capable of, of looking into microscopic level phenomena that occurs during the coal fly ash dissolution. There are a couple of key things about the device that we developed. One, it is completely made of Teflon. So it's made out of PFA films, which is a variant of Teflon. And this is really important because it offers the chemical resistance as well as the transparency that we need for in-situ visualization of rare earth elements recovery using really harsh regions such as strong acids or strong bases, which is what we are really going to need if we want to tap into the embedded rare earth elements within the aluminum silicate phases. And the second thing, is that we created this device such that we are working with really thin channels. And what it does is that it allows us to control the amount of ash volume that is being investigated. This way, we can clearly see at a very microscopic fundamental level what is happening and how we can use this information to ultimately scale up and create a feasible way of recovering rare earth elements out of fly ash. Our Teflon microfluidic device was fabricated by using a CO2 laser cutter to create nanopore entries as well as this channel for fluid flow in PFA films. We then throughoutly clean, align those films, and we thermally bond to create our Teflon chip. The flow channel that we created is usually 20 millimeter in length. And the width of the channel can be two millimeters and we've done as small as 100 microns width and the thickness of the channel is 120 microns and we can make it as small as 40 microns. The coal fly ash within our Teflon ship can be arranged in two ways. One, we can look at individual particles and we do that by placing one glassy sphere inside our micro channel and then we use, we have the Teflon top layer put it on top and bonded. So for instance, as you can see in this image, we deposited a very tiny, about 20 micron sized uh, glassy sphere. And we can use that to truly delineate the recovery mechanism for rare earth elements that happen during the dissolution. Another coal fly ash arrangement that you can do within the microfluidic device is a bead pack. So instead of having one individual particle, you can create a sort of porous media reactive cell by injecting your coal fly ash and tapering your channel such that your small particulates actually get retained within the channel. And that could mimic the dissolution process that you would observe at large scale, but it still gives you the opportunity of looking at a micro scale, what are the recovery processes and the reaction kinetics that are happening. The key conclusions from this project so far are that one, coal fly ash shows significant potential for rare earth elements recovery, given that their total RE concentration range from 400 parts per million all the way to 700 parts per million. Second, 
we've seen that the rare earth elements are primarily found within the glassy aluminous silicate phases and this is key given that it shows us that just leaching the coal fly ash would not be enough to truly tap into the potential for rare earth elements encapsulated within the glass spheres. And third, we can use microfluidic Teflon ships to directly visualize reaction kinetics and mechanisms that will be occurring since we need to use the solution and harsh reagents to really break down those aluminum silicates and explore the rare earth elements out of coal fly ash samples. Our future work within this project will focus on one, delineating the dissolution rates, reaction mechanisms that occur uh, using our Teflon microfluidic device. Second, we'll be developing an efficient rare earth elements recovery workflow, and that will be based on the, you know, optimizing the process of exploring the rare earth elements out of coal fly ash using our microfluidic device. And third, we will be developing a full recovery plan based on this fundamental understanding on how we can officially recover rare earth elements out of fly ash. And ultimately, we hope that that would enable US domestic production of rare earth elements from coal fly ash. This research wouldn't be possible without the guidance and support of my advisor, Professor Wen Song, as well as members of the Song Research Group, who include Arthur Devlichen and Shun Xiangxia. This research was also made possible through our collaborators, Professor Donald DePaulo at UC Berkeley and Dr. Stacey Louie at UT Austin, as well as through the support of UT Austin Energy Institute. Now, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer during the Q&A uh, session at the end. But also, if you're watching this on demand, feel free to reach out to me. I have left my contact information at the bottom of this slide.